Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from AntiWar.com, and this is Anti-War News for Friday, September 2nd, 2022. This is the last show for the week. I'll be back after the weekend to catch everybody up on the news. But today, at the top of AntiWar.com, the first story, nuclear deal seems unlikely as the U.S. slams Iran's response as moving backwards. So Iran has submitted its latest response in the EU-mediated negotiations with the U.S. to revive the nuclear deal known as the JCPOA, but things aren't looking good. Uh, A U.S. official characterized Iran's response as moving backwards. Iran delivered the text early Friday morning to Iran time and called its response constructive, but in comments to Politico, an unnamed U.S. official slammed the Iranian response as not at all encouraging. The U.S. official, a senior U.S. official, said, quote, we are studying Iran's response, but the bottom line is that it is not at all encouraging. Based on their answer, we appear to be moving backwards, end quote. So the U.S. official wouldn't detail the com- the contents of the text, but a European diplomat also shared the negative view of Iran's response. A Europe, the European diplomat described it to Politico as negative and not reasonable. So it's not clear yet if the U.S. view on this on Iran's response, if this means that the Biden administration will end the talks on reviving the JCPOA, the negotiations they've dragged out throughout Biden's presidency as he's refused to lift all Trump era sanctions on Iran. Iran has said from the beginning, if the U.S. did that, they would bring their nuclear program back into the strict limits of the JCPOA. But because Biden initially refused, they've been in these negotiations and Biden's taken a very hard line policy. Before Iran submitted its response, U.S. officials said this was last week that they were closer to a deal after Iran made several concessions. But based uh, based on recent media reports, the only outstanding issues were related to guarantees for if the U.S. withdraws from the JCPOA by reimposing sanctions, as it did back in 2018. But, you know, this is an issue because JCPOA is not a treaty. The next administration does not have to follow it. They could pull out. From the reports, Iran was looking for guarantees that um, would be able to be kind of included in the deal for if a future administration pulled out of it. And Iran, they were also looking for the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to close its inquiry into traces of uranium at undeclared nuclear sites. But last week, a U.S. official said Iran dropped this demand to have it linked to the to the to the deal. But then Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi, this was earlier this week, he said that without settling that issue, the IA inquiry, that talking about an agreement would be meaningless. So that could be part of the issue. It's really not clear. I don't want to speculate too much just because we we just don't know. And another thing to mention is that the U.S. has been under a lot of pressure from Israel to just exit these negotiations and from hawks in Congress, which we'll get more into in another story. So that could also be a factor in the U.S. just Um, dismissing this Iranian response, which is what seems to be what they're doing here. And, you know, I've been skeptical that a deal would be revived, but I was hoping something would happen and we would see sanctions lifted on Iran, especially because that would get a lot of oil back on the global market and send energy prices down. Um, The next one here, this is Somewhat related, the U.S. signs a deal to give Israel four refueling planes that are needed to bomb Iran. So the Pentagon on Thursday, they signed a contract with Boeing, the aircraft aircraft maker, to supply Israel with four KC-46 refueling planes. And these are needed for potential Israeli strikes on Iran. Although these aircraft, they will not be delivered until at least 2025. So Israel, if they wanted to bomb Iran, their jets have to fly about 1,200, not, uh, yeah, 1,200 miles to strike the targets that they want to hit in Iran. And according to just Israeli media reports and, and the way I've read it is that they have 
the tanker planes that they have are aging right now and they can't really support that mission. Uh, Israel's other option would be to refuel in the Gulf, which may be possible now that Israel is nor has normalized with the UAE and Bahrain. But still, this these tankers are said to be kind of crucial if Israel would actually want to launch airstrikes on Iran. We know Israel carries out covert attacks inside Iran all the time. But um, so the deal, it's worth $927 million for four planes. And Israel is purchasing the planes from Boeing with money from the $3.8 billion in military aid that it receives from the U.S. each year. That's why in the headline I said the U.S. signs a deal to give Israel these planes because they're buying it with money that they were handed to uh, from the U.S. So as part of this $3.8 billion in military aid that the U.S. receives each year, I'm sorry, that Israel receives from the U.S. each year, 3.3 billion is in foreign military financing and that's a state department program that gives foreign governments money to purchase u.s made military equipment israel has has the option to order for more of these tanker planes and this deal has been in the works for a long time israel has previously asked the u.s if they could accelerate the delivery of the planes but so far the u.s has denied that request again they're saying the earliest they'll be delivered is 2025. So Iran doesn't have to worry about them using these anytime soon. But the U.S. military, um, in order for Israel to get the planes faster, the U.S. military would have to give up their waiting for some of these planes too. So they would have to bypass them. Um, but Israel, you know, recently over the past year, they've been, the Israeli military has been preparing for strikes on Iran. They've been planning for it. Uh, they recently held war games where Israeli war Israeli warplanes simulated launching what they called large scale attacks on Iran over the Mediterranean Sea. And during previous rounds of negotiations between the US and Iran, Israel was always hinting that they would attack Iran if the deal was revived. Uh, but again, they're not really capable of launching airstrikes in Iran. Another issue is that since Israel launches these covert attacks inside Iran. Iran has built a lot of its nuclear facilities deep underground. And Israel says that that's what it wants to hit. And they don't really have the bombs, bunker busting bombs that could that could really destroy those facilities. All right. So the next one here, this is more pressure about the Iran deal. This is from Middle East Eye. 50 House lawmakers pressed Biden against return to the Iran nuclear deal. So it was a bipartisan group of 50 House lawmakers. They sent a letter to President Biden expressing deep concerns about a return to the Iran nuclear deal. The lawmakers, 34 Democrats and 16 Republicans, they highlighted several issues they had with reported provisions in a, in a potential return to the deal. That's all just based on the media reports. Um, but this is the House. So this 50 House representatives isn't too many um but still it's significant that it's 34 democrats to 16 republicans i think that says something because it's usually the republicans that are the real opponents of this deal a lot of democrats don't like it now either but um usually when you see stuff like this it's mostly republicans okay so the next one here, Taiwan shoots down a drone for the first time over a tiny island near mainland China. So tensions continue to escalate over uh, near Taiwan and China. Taiwan's military said on Thursday that it had shot down an unidentified civilian drone that flew over a tiny islet in Kinmen County, a Taiwanese-controlled archipelago off the southeastern coast of mainland China. The incident took place near Xiu Islet, which is about, it's only 2.5 miles away from the Chinese mainland city of Xiamen. The drone entered restricted waters around Xiu and was shot down after it ignored warnings. If you're in the article, there's a picture of this tiny island. It's just, it's really small with the skyline of the Chinese city of Xiamen in the background. So that's how close it is. And I also included a map in the article because it's very important just to drive home that this, these, where this stuff is happening with these drones, 
where Taiwan just shot a drone down on the coast of mainland China. It's across the, it's on the opposite side of the Taiwan Strait as the island of Taiwan, only 2.5 miles from a Chinese city. Um, so this incident, it marks the first time that Taiwan's military shot down a drone over territory that it controls. Earlier in the week, Taiw Taiwanese forces fired warning shots at another drone over the Kinmen Islands, which are also known as the Kwamoi Islands. Taiwan didn't identify the drone it shot down as Chinese. In their statement, they didn't say it was a Chinese drone. They said it was civilian, unidentified, but it said that it flew from the direction of China, from the city that's there. And since House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taipei at the beginning of August, Taiwan has been detecting drones near its territory in Kinmen County regularly. So this has been a regular thing that these drones were flying around here and over this Taiwanese territory on the mainland. And um, the downing of the drone, it came after Taiwan's military warned that it would fire on drones that entered its airspace. On Wednesday, Taiwan's military issued another warning saying that it would launch counterattacks if Chinese military ships or planes entered the territorial waters or airspace around Taiwan. So now they're talking about the island of Taiwan. Airspace and territorial waters, they extend 12 nautical miles off the coast of Taiwan so far. According to Taiwanese officials, China has stayed out of that area even when it launched its largest ever military exercises in response to Pelosi visiting. But they're saying that they'll launch, they'll basically sounds like they're warning that they'll fire on Chinese ships or planes if they enter that area. So tensions are really soaring here. And this incident, it really highlights the danger of the current tensions. I mean, China, uh, Taiwan shooting a drone down just right across from a Chinese city. And these tensions, they show no sign of waning as U.S. delegations continue to make trips to Taipei and the Chinese military is keeping the pressure on Taiwan. So the next one here, Taiwan signs a $555 million contract to purchase U.S.-made drones. Taiwan signed this contract um, on Wednesday, according to Taiwanese officials, to purchase four MQ-9B Sea Guardian drones from the United States. So the MQ-9B Sea Guardian that is made by General Atomics, and it is a naval variant of the MQ-9 Reaper drone that the U.S. has used in its drone wars in the Middle East pretty frequently. And But it has more of a focus on maritime surveillance. It could fly longer distances. Under the contract, the first drone will be delivered by 2025. So 555 million for only four drones. Just see how expensive these things are. It's really amazing. And this deal comes as Taiwan's government. They've been pledging to spend more on its on their military in the wake of these largest ever Chinese military drills, which were a response to Pelosi's visit. The Chinese drills have spurred mo more calls in the U.S. to sell more arms to Taiwan, and the Biden administration is reportedly preparing to ask Congress uh, to approve a new $1.1 billion arms sale for Taipei. That arms sale, it includes air-to-air -air missiles and anti-ship missiles, harpoon missiles. So it's just, you know, just a bonanza for the arms makers. These tensions, they're really benefiting from, just like they're benefiting from the war in Ukraine. Uh, but there have been some issues with the delivery of U.S. arms to Taiwan. They're currently facing a pretty major backlog where about $14 billion in weapons haven't been de delivered yet that they've purchased. The Pentagon said that it's due to pandemic-related acquisition issues. But the backlog equipment, it includes Taiwan a few years ago purchased 66 F-16 fighter jets and that was a deal worth $8 billion, so they still haven't gotten those jets. So all the hawks in Congress are unhappy about that. They really want to arm Taiwan, get them more weapons. Um, the next one, this is sort of more about the economic um, relationship between the U.S. and China. The U.S. has tightened export c controls on chips, on semiconductors uh, being sold to China including they banned uh, NVIDIA, which is a, a big U.S. microchip maker, from sending certain types of chips to China. And it sent their stock uh, crashing down pretty good. 
but it's more of an example of kind of the economic decoupling. You know, the U.S. and Chinese economies are so intertwined that the idea of a war between them, it's really unimaginable uh, as things are right now. And it would take a really long time to fully decouple. And it's not that we're necessarily going in that direction. But since Trump, really, since the tariffs and he started sanctions and, and these export blacklists, and it, it's this road of economic decoupling, and they are getting less reliant on each other. Still, again, it's so intertwined the economies, it would really take a long time for a significant decoupling. But it, you know, as that happens, that can make a, a war, a conflict between the US and China more likely, or it could make it more likely that the US would try to sanction China, similar to the way it did Russia. But as things stand now, there's no way they could do it. It would hurt our economy uh, pretty seriously. But it's just something to keep an eye on is this because there are a lot of calls for the for the U.S. and China, for the U.S. to totally decouple from China, which is something that is pretty unimaginable, would have been unimaginable just a few years ago. All right. The next one here, U.S. and its allies, they prepare to outline a Russian oil price cap plan. So speaking of U.S. policies that could really hurt the U.S. economy, um, this plan, this to put a price cap on Russian oil. This has been being pushed by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and she's meeting with other finance other finance ministers from the Group of Seven on Friday, and they're expected to outline their plan to implement a price cap on Russian oil, which experts have warned could send oil prices soaring if Russia doesn't comply. According to the Wall Street Journal, after the meeting, the G7 ministers, they're expected to release an endorsement of the price cap plan and commit to finalizing its implementation. So the idea of the price cap is to limit Russia's profits from oil sales, which are already higher now than they were before the war. It really shows how the sanctions have backfired. So they want to do that while keeping oil on the market, on the global market, because if you take Russian oil out of the mix, prices are going to go up. Um, so Yellen has been really pushing this idea over fears that prices will skyrocket once the EU's Russian oil ban takes effect on December 5th. So now the EU Russian oil ban, Russia's already ready for that. They have markets elsewhere where they could sell. The banning of oil, selling oil to Europe isn't really the issue. The issue is that Russia, Russian oil shipments rely mostly on insurance from Europe and the UK. So the EU oil ban will also ban insurance on Russian oil shipments. Now it's funny because the U.S. really pushed Europe to do this oil ban. And now they're just saying, oh, this insurance ban is kind of going to go too far. It just really shows it's like they're flailing just how poorly they've executed this attempt at economic war against Russia. Um, so the plan is that Russian oil shipments could only be insured if there if Russian oil is being sold at a set price. Now, there's so many things wrong with this plan. And the first off, it requires Russia to cooperate to say, okay, I'll only sell oil at this price, which is just so unlikely. And even if Russia does cooperate, insurance companies, shipping insurers have said there's not really any way to enforce it. You know, they can't really verify at what price the oil was sold for they can it's easy to kind of deceive the insurers if you're selling at a different price so it also requires cooperation from india and china who have been buying tons of russian oil they're at, at a discount already at a disc it's already at a discount so they have no reason to sort of rock the boat with russia in this situation so in the worst case scenario they try to implement this and Russia rep responds by cutting its oil production. That would send, really send prices skyrocketing. I mean, there's been some really um, alarming predictions by experts and analysts. Uh, analysts at JP Morgan Chase, they said in the worst case scenario, if Russia cuts you know, a certain amount of production, it could send prices up to $380 per barrel. Uh, which is just insane. And oil prices are currently hovering around $100 per barrel. I mean, these are unimaginable prices, how much we would be paying at, at the pump if that's what 
oil was worth. But despite all these warnings, that's the worst one. But a lot have said, you know, upper hundreds, over 200 if Russia really cuts oil production. But they're still going ahead with, they're still pushing this plan and thinking about implementing it. And a big part of the reason why is that if the insurance ban really affects Russia, uh, oil prices, that, you know, as elections come near, uh, you know, it's going to be 2023 soon and people are going to be gearing up for 2024 election. You know, the if gas is really high, I mean, that's people vote with their wallet. So it wouldn't help Biden, but it seems like it'll be a mess either way. And now with the insurance, you know, Russia can find alternatives. They've said that they could do state guarantees, uh, but they could definitely find alternatives. But there will be an initial, like, there will definitely be an initial shock just because so many of their oil shipments are reliant on European insurance. Okay. And the next one here the IAEA arrives at the Zaporizhia power plant, establishes a continued presence. A team of inspectors from the IAEA, they finally arrived at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is in the southeastern Ukrainian city of Enerhodor on Thursday for this um, IAEA chief, Rafael Grossi. He said in a video on Twitter that he had completed his first tour of key areas at the plant and that his team was going to stay at the facility. So I think he's leaving, but inspectors are staying there for what he called a continued presence. So this plant, as I've talked about a lot, it's been controlled by Russia since March. Same thing with the territory around it. But recently, the plants come under attack, raising fears of a potential nuclear disaster. R Ukraine has tried to blame Russia for the shelling on the plant, but Moscow really has little reason to attack a facility that it controls. In the morning before Grossi and his team arrived at the plant, Russia accused Ukraine of attempting to launch an, launch an attack to recapture the plant. So Russia claimed that they thwarted an operation by 60 Ukrainian militants, saboteurs, they call them. They said that they landed on the shore near the power plant. The plant's located on the Dnieper River. On one side, Russia, there's the plant, Russian-controlled territory. The other side, Ukraine controls it. So Russia is saying that these 60 Ukrainian fighters came across the river and they were going to try to attack the plant, but they stopped them. And they also said that there was shelling in the city around the plant. And for their part, Ukraine accused Russia of shelling the city that Russia controls. And which doesn't make much sense. And they said that they were also shelling the corridors that were set up for the IAEA inspectors to go through. Now, these claims haven't been confirmed, neither the Russian or the Ukrainian. But Grossi, he did acknowledge that military activity in the region while he was traveling. He said, quote, there were moments when fire was obvious. Heavy machine guns, artillery, mortars at two or three times were really very concerning, end quote. So the IAEA, they could potentially attribute blame for the recent attacks on the power plant. So far, they haven't said anything like that. But that's part of the recent reason why Russia has been urging for the IAEA to go to the plant. They say once they're there, they'll see that it's Ukraine that's been doing these attacks. That's why I doubt the Ukrainian claim that Russia was trying to shell the corridors that were set up for the IAEA. They've been wanting this inspection for a long time. The next one here, this is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. The West claims Russia is weaponizing energy by slowing es exports after pledging to isolate Moscow. So the White House has accused Russia of weaponizing energy by reducing gas es exports to Europe. Moscow announced that the Nord Stream 1 pipeline would close, citing sanctions and maintenance as the cause. Nord Stream 1 connects Russia and Germany. We've heard a lot about Nord Stream 2, which was being built the U.S. really tried to stop with sanctions and stuff. And it appears that this they've gotten their wish. The, Germany has suspended it. The construction of Nord Stream 2 was completed, but Germany suspended like the final, I forget exactly what process, but it's suspended. And, you know, I can't imagine that being up and running anytime soon. But anyway, Nord Stream 1 has been shut down a few times throughout the war. And... It was definitely sanctions one time because there was a turbine being repaired for the pipeline that was stuck in Canada because of sanctions. They couldn't ship it back. 
but then they eventually did. And, uh, but it, you know, the whole process slowed everything down. Um, but who knows exactly why they shut it down this latest time, but either way, you know, the U S and the EU have been accusing Russia of weaponizing energy at the same time. They're explicitly saying that they're trying to destroy Russia's economy. They're waging an economic war against Russia. And then they act surprised when Russia retaliates by cutting gas or something like that. Um, it's really just so hypocritical. Uh, this charge, the latest one, came from John Kirby, who's the spokesperson for the White House National Security Council. He was previously the spokesman for uh, the Pentagon. But he said, quote, Putin is playing a game with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. I think it's a game. Our problem right now is that we are not in a position to adequately respond to this game, end quote. I mean, it's just such an obvious response. It's so short, shows just how short-sighted the economic sanctions and stuff have been. Uh, the last one here, Francis Macron, he defends his continued diplomacy with Putin. French President Emmanuel Macron on Thursday in a foreign policy speech, he just defended the fact that he's still talking to Putin. He's one of the very few Western leaders that has talked that has kept contacts with him. Now, France, as an EU member and a NATO member, has joined in on the sanctions against Russia and is arming Ukraine and is being hawkish. But Macron's still talking to Putin. He said, quote, the job of a diplomat is to talk to everybody and particularly the people we disagree with, end quote. I mean, it's just such a true statement. <laughs> and, you know, when you think about Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, he didn't speak with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, until July 29th since Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. And they didn't even discuss the war. They, they discussed the prisoner exchange. But it's just completely ridiculous uh, that the who he's supposed to be the U.S.'s top diplomat, but he's completely failed at that job. So Macron, he said, oh, we don't want Turkey to be the only world power that is talking to Russia. And Turkey, Erdogan, um, he's kind of emerged as a broker between Russia and Ukraine. But thanks to Turkey and thanks to the UN, they, they brokered talks between Russia and Ukraine to get Ukrainian grain moving out of Ukraine's Black Sea ports. And that's been a very successful deal. Over 700,000 tons of foodstuffs has been exported since that deal was signed. So that's what diplomacy gets you. All the U.S. was doing about the grain thing was just accusing Russia of blockading the ports, which it wasn't doing. Um, the issue was the mines that, that Ukraine laid. And I'm not saying that Russia doesn't have responsibility. They laid the mines because of the war. But it just wasn't what the U.S. was characterizing it as Russian ships just blocking the ports. That's not what it was. It was because of the mines and, and just other issues. But just complaining about it doesn't get you anywhere. Diplomacy does, which uh, was very successful in this time. But Macron, he also said in the speech that Russia can't win the war and that it has to end either with the Ukrainian victory or a negotiated settlement that's acceptable to Ukraine. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, again, the, this is the last show for the week. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Um, buy some merch. There's a link down below. Buy some great antiwar.com t-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, stickers, things like that to support the show. You could also support us by donating to antiwar.com, antiwar.com slash donate. Contact the show, news at antiwar.com. Follow me on Twitter. You can talk to me there. Um, but I'll be back and after the weekend, I hope you guys have a good one and I'll see you soon. Thank you.